guys. Ooh, I'm here again. I haven't seen you in a while. Sorry about that. Life got a hold of me. <laughs> okay, so last I said I was in Luke. Let me just check where we're in Luke because I have read on quite far from here. I'm reading from the New Living Translation now, so I don't need my glasses. So the last place I was uh, about with Luke was with uh, Zechariah. Um, so now let's move oh, with the John the Baptist. And I just want to jump into the next slot fast so that I have more time to actually discuss it with you. Um, okay, so if you don't have your Bible, go grab one, use your phone, you version app, whatever you want to do. And let's read. So wait, let me just check where was the last I was actually on before I go on talking about this. Uh, so I was at Luke 1 verse 18 to 20. Oh guys, I moved on a lot since then. Alright, so meanwhile the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out of the sanctuary. I think we already read that. And that means at that point he just couldn't speak. He's so okay, let's just recap quickly. We're in Luke. We already talked about where Luke came from, who wrote the book, why he wrote the book. That was in previous episodes. And then we talked about John, uh, Zachariah, and um, Elizabeth, and how Elizabeth got pregnant at an age she shouldn't have, after many years of praying about it, and probably just giving up, but it was the correct time for her to get pregnant. And because John didn't quite believe the angel Gabriel, he became mute, he couldn't speak, and then when he went out of the temple where he was doing his duties, he couldn't talk to anyone. So then it says that Elizabeth got pregnant. It says um, from verse 23, it says, When Zechariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Soon afterwards, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and went into seclusion for five months. She didn't come out of her house for five months. How kind the Lord is, she exclaimed. He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. So, you know, guys, that was a reality. Not having children wasn't, wasn't just a disappointment. Um, at that time, it was a disgrace. Something was wrong with you. And let's be honest, up till recently and even now sometimes if you don't if you are barren if people don't have children there's still this stigma going on something's wrong you did something wrong that's why you're not pregnant the birth of jesus foretold this is verse 26 now in the six months month of elizabeth's pregnancy god sent the angel gabriel to nazareth a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Now, if you go look at Matthew, he also states that Mary was a descendant of David. So at this point, it was just um, Joseph being mentioned, but Mary was also a descendant of David, or the, the tribe of David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favoured woman. The Lord is with you. Now, I want to stand on that. Greetings, favoured woman. So it means that God looked at this particular young woman, and she was still very young. I mean, she was probably around 14, 15. Um, and 
he looked at her and he said, wait, I favor her. I choose her. I prefer her. I look at her and I'm thinking, this is the correct person for this particular job. The Lord is with you, which is a confirmation. He's with her. Confused and disturbed, I would have been too. Mary tried to think about what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thankfully, you're like on the other side of the screen. So um, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and we will call the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her six months. For the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. So, I think I'm going to stop there. As I said, I've read the whole thing. I think I am again at chapter 5 already. But I want to stop there. There's a couple of things that stand out for me. Firstly, God's favor. Um, just hold on a moment. I want to, I've got this bookie, you see. And I just want to check up because it does have a concordance. Just check up the word favor here. Because it does have different meanings. And I'm um, currently listening again to... Um, to a, a podcast of... Uh, the, the Bible Project, where Tim Mackey and John, I don't know what his surname is, talk. And I've, I've realized again, you know, we so easily think we understand something, but then we don't. <laughs> um, just want to see if they've got... Okay, so no, they don't actually have the meaning of the word here. Let me just see. No, they don't have a concordance. They just have like a brief Bible references. Which is now sad because I would have really liked to have a concordance. Um, but, and I can't go look at my phone now. My, okay, let me just see. Maybe I've got one in this very much falling apart Bible of mine. I think I do have a concordance here. Ah, I do. Okay, so while I'm searching for that book, oh, for the word, I, I think we very often think we understand words and then we just don't. Uh, okay, your favor. Um... Okay, now these are also, 
no explanations of the word. Anyway, Strong's. <laughs> At one point, I will go buy myself a proper, like a dictionary thingy. So, here's the thing. If you find favor with God, to me personally, that means he looks at you and he decides this person is suitable for this work. Or I can use this person, in this case anyway, this person is suitable for this work. And Mary was a normal person, everyday person. There was nothing fancy about Mary. Um, contrary to some belief systems, Mary was not anything else than just a normal person. She had children after Jesus. She had a normal life, except that her normal life was connected to this ma boy, this man, who she knew in her heart. In John it says, um, oh no, actually it's, it's here in Luke, it's the, she, she um, kept it in her heart. So there were many things that happened and then you know, it says, and she kept this in her heart. So she didn't forget about it. Something was different. And she knew it was different because she knew the way Jesus was conceived wasn't normal. She had other children, as I said. She knew what normal birth looked like. She knew what normal conception was about. This was different. And she knew that. So um, that for me is interesting, is the people... That God chooses for certain jobs are very often the most ordinary of people. The people that no one would think would be worthy. Um, they're not rich. They're not pretty. They're not um, well educated often. But he chooses them because he knows that they will listen to him. And, and I think that that comes through when Mary says here at the end, I am the Lord's servant. Servant, may everything you have said about me come true. So if Mary was well educated, she might have thought, you know, this can't be right. Let's go look up I mean, today's life. You would say, okay, let's go see Immaculate Conception, Google it, see if it's possible. And you'll get a lot of answers. <laughs> That's not saying no, it does. it's not possible. But you see, for God, anything is possible. The same God that created Adam and Eve, the same God that breathed his life, his Ruach spirit into Adam is the same God that can make Mary conceive. Why not? If it is, if, if God created Adam, if you believe that, if you know he created him from scratch and then he breathed his Ruach spirit into him, why not? Why why not be able to, to make Mary conceive? He is the creator of life. So that for me, those are the things that stand out. That um, Mary didn't question. She was confused and she was, what's going on? But she didn't question God at the end of the day. She didn't say, but this isn't possible. And then the other thing that does stand out for me is it says here that um, gives a good description of who Jesus will be. It also gives a good description of Jesus's physical, the human part of Jesus, of his um, ancestry, which is actually very important because otherwise um, you would have been kind of lost. In Jewish culture, understanding the ancestry of somebody was very important. And again, up to a couple of years ago, 100 years or so, it was really important to all cultures to know exactly where you came from. Um, so that, that for me is important. Um, there was another thing that stood out for me now. Oh, best part. Very best part. 
and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. So, there's a lot of stuff according, uh, you know, about Israel at the moment. And Israel, firstly, the Bible states clearly. Um, if you bless uh, Jerusalem, if you pray over Jerusalem, you will be blessed. So there's a, there's this thing. God chose not only specific. He doesn't only choose specific people. He sometimes choose chooses specific venues. And Israel, the country Israel, as it was originally, not like we know it today, because it was quite a bit bigger, but Israel was God's chosen venue for his chosen people to do a certain job. Do I believe that if you put your foot on Israel's ground, there's no, I don't. I don't. I don't believe. I'm very careful to even say the Holy Land because the holiness is where God is. Which means in the New Testament with the Holy Spirit dwelling in each of us, everywhere we go in His Spirit with Him dwelling in us, that's where He is. So I don't believe God dwells in Israel specifically. He's there because His children are there, many Messianic Jews many um, Muslim people that have come to Christ, many secular people who have come to Christ, many, many people that I know of recently anyway that have given their lives to Jesus and accepted Jesus as the Messiah. Those are the children of God. Jesus said, those who do the will of my Father, if you accept Jesus as your Messiah, you're part of his family. Long stories. Anyway, still... There's this thing where God chooses these people, chooses these people, chooses Abraham and Isaac, takes Jacob, he turns Jacob into a nation and he calls him Israel. And he has never abandoned them. I, I don't believe that for one moment. God has never given up on them. Just, ah, you know what, that was a mistake. Uh, scratch that, I'm moving on. That's not how God works. He still loves Israel. Is there salvation outside of Jesus? No. Unless you've never heard of him, then the Bible clearly states you will be judged on merit basically but if you've heard of him and you don't want to accept him as your messiah no there's no salvation there's no salvation in in following the jewish laws no salvation in that there's salvation in jesus christ i was listening to um a testimony of a messianic jewish lady who gave her life to jesus and she's a jew and she says i'm a jew i'm not going to stop being a jew but I am a Jew who believes that the Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua, as she calls him, is the true Messiah. And he was firstly the Messiah of the Jews. Exactly that. So, there's only one Savior. And that one Savior is called Jesus. And his life was recorded his birth is being recorded right here um and his kingdom will reign forever and his kingdom doesn't look like the world world's idea of a kingdom uh, the guys from um the bible project said uh, i think it's it's to make he always says it's an upside down kingdom it's different than what you would normally expect a kingdom to be like. 
Anyway, that's a whole different story. So I want to share this with you because um, I'll, if I remember to do it, because I always forget to do it, then I just, you know, it doesn't happen. But I'll go back to all the episodes at some time and just add all the stuff that I'm saying, I'm serious, I was saying I'm going to add. But I would really like to add that because the Bible Project is a fantastic, is a fantastic platform. I think I've mentioned it before, but I can really, really say I'm learning a lot from them. And they're talking specifically, they've got a whole series about the Servant of the Mount now, which is so... amazing to listen to gives so much more perspective on things that we already thought we knew and we understood but there's always something lost in translation you know so that that's fantastic and i've been listening to that a lot yeah, oh if you don't understand where i'm going with this now i'm kind of finished talking about luke <laughs> got other stuff i want to talk about as well the thing that I do want to talk about the most at the moment is prayer. Um, praying. The importance of prayer. The absolute necessity of prayer. And and this has been something that's been in my heart for a long time. And it, it's, it's a normal lifestyle for me to always constantly be talking to God. I, it's, I know pe everybody's different. Um... But that's my general relationship with him, is I am just talking to him and waiting until he answers me and then conversations. But there's a conversational prayer and then there are other, uh, uh, other forms of praying as well, like warfare prayer and, you know, different types of praying. And last night we had a meeting where uh, Josh Jane, Pastor, Elder, rather, from Paul came. His name is Cassie. And he taught about, he came to t talk about prayer. He said, it's something that's lacking. And and all, the Holy Spirit showed it out. It's something that's lacking in, in the corporate body of Josh Jane. And... He came to talk about it and he mentioned a couple of stuff that really stand, stood out for me. And as he said it, I knew that's actually normally, it's more confirmation for us um, because that's how we pray. Say 80% of the time. The other 20% is just gibberish, I guess. Although, praise God, he even listens to our gibberish. But he mentioned a couple of, thing, couple of things that I would like to talk about. Firstly, he mentioned the, and, and I need to make this kind of fast, because he said the way you start praying in faith, you have to pray in faith. If you just talk, it's, it has no value. If what you are praying has no faith behind it, zero, none. So how do you get faith? That was his teaching. Firstly, you have to you you have to connect with God. You have to actually know who you are praying to. You have to be praying to a person. And he made it. He made, really gave these nice practical things about Jesus said. He started, "Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name." What does hallowed mean? What does it mean? If we say, let your name be glorified, your, let your name be holy, let your name, it means we exalt his name. How do you exalt God's name? By going into the word and saying, who is God? The character of God, the truth of God, who is he? He's kind, he's slow to anger, he's um quick to forgive he um is loyal in love he is the creator of the universe he is the one who created the stars with a, with his breath all of that stuff is stuff you will only know if you are focused on his word 
That's where you learn about him, who he is. He's the one who got Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. And even in their disobedience for 40 years, he took care of them. When, I mean, me, in my human, I would, I, no, I just leave them, just leave them, let them go on, I'll find someone else. He didn't. And actually, he didn't because of the prayers of Moses. Moses would go to God and petition. The same goes for Abram and Lot. If it wasn't for Abram petitioning, praying before God, and realizing who he's praying to and who he's petitioning to, Lot would have been gone. So that's the power of prayer. The power of prayer is also with that you need to know God you need to connect with him how do you connect with him by knowing his word those two are crucial if you want to pray in faith you need to firstly well actually have a relationship with God give your life to Jesus you have now redeemed he, or he has redeemed you you are saved right but if you want to get to know him that's not enough you need to go to your word you need to go to the bible you need to read the bible you need to need to get to know who god is and on the grounds of knowing the word of god that's how you can pray because the minute you start praying the word of god there's such power in that um that's just such such a power that's um the that's when it starts kicking in uh, Cassie said yes, last night, and that's when it starts kicking in. When you start praying to the God, firstly acknowledge Him. First and foremost, you acknowledge Him. Don't start big prayers without acknowledging who He is. Give Him glory, praise Him, honor Him for who He is. Not for what He's doing for you, for who He is. Then you start praying, but the more you have of the scriptures, the more accurate you can pray. And the more you know that you will be praying according to his will. Because I'm telling you now, if you are going to be sitting there and praying for God, that your... Uh, adulterous relationship will grow. Uh, it's not going to happen. Because it's not within his will. That's not what his word says. Okay. If you're going to sit there praying that you can get as rich as possible and have as much money as possible within the next couple of months because you want to go buy yourself a new house. Nah. That's not what the Bible tells us. The Bible says, I, Paul said, I've learned to be content in all things. Your motivation needs to be correct. Your motivation will only be correct if you know the word of God and you understand his motivations and his heart. So that's another important thing, the word. With the word, the Holy Spirit, I mean, honestly, praying without the Holy Spirit makes no sense for me. It, it's like, you, you can't, you, you get the Holy, you start understanding the Holy Spirit the minute you are connected with God and the minute... You start reading your Bible because then you start understanding the dynamics, kingdom dynamics better, and the trilogy. Yeah, the um, yeah, it's the trilogy, trinity. Nah, trinity. There we go. You understand the trinity dynamics better, and that that helps a lot. Okay, because then you know you you praying in the spirit with the holy spirit the holy spirit is there with you praying through you you are that that connection is essential and i know that sounds a bit weird but if you don't know it ask him ask and you will receive promise you it is his will that you receive the holy spirit it is his will that you will be baptized in the spirit so if you haven't been baptized in the holy spirit ask him ask him Lord, I want to be baptized in your spirit because I want to come closer to you. There's no way he's not going to give you that because that was his will from the very beginning. It says so in the Bible. Anyway, and then 
fellowshipping and praying with other people. The word says where two or, two or more, two or three, two or more are gathered in my name, I am there. So where two or more people are praying in unity within his will, there's just that little extra oomph, you know. It's like when one person is shouting in the streets, people kind of ignore him. But when another person comes in and another person comes in and it gets really loud, it's not like God needs the loudness. It's more us. But where two or more are gathered in my name and they are praying, I am there. So if you stand there and you're praying in unity and you're praying scriptures and you are just praying in unity, there's something really powerful about that. So let's come back to why I'm saying this. Um, look, this is an important topic for me anyway. It's a, it's a top important topic for me and it's an exciting topic for me. My, and while I'm saying that, I can't pray my hair right, can I? No. Well, they're irritating me, but never mind. Um, <laughs> if you are a South African, you know our election time is coming now. If you're not a South African, and you're listening to this, and you are a born-again Christian, please pray with us. Stand with us in faith. It's not just in South Africa that we have problems. Uh, it's worldwide. We all know that. This is not South Africa. South Africa only. It's the entire world. Is a mess. But what we want in South Africa and what we are trusting God for is that the people that he, that the people he chooses to govern us because he chooses the government people not us he chooses the government that our hearts will come to a place of repentance and humility that we will humble ourselves before him and we will petition before him that there will come order that order godly order that which is right in his eyes will start happening in this country again for the sake of his kingdom. In our country, we still have freedom to speak his name openly, to talk to people openly, to lead people to Jesus openly. And these are the privileges that we still have. And we um, really trust the Lord that for the sake of his kingdom, the government that he puts in place will help Keep that, but even allow it to grow. Um, we need a godly government. But we all know that people are people. And only God changes the heart of men. But yes, our country needs prayer. Those of us who are in South Africa, guys, don't pray according to your own ideas or your own agendas. This is a warning from me. And I'm, it's a prophetic warning. I will almost never say in public, this is a prophetic this or this. But I'm telling you now, this is a prophetic warning. Don't pray according to your own agendas. Don't pray according to your own opinions. Don't pray according to your own desires. Go to God, ask Him what He wants. And pray according to what He wants. He made it very, very clear for me. For two. I don't know where my English went to. My language went to in general. Sorry. Made it very clear to me. Change in this country will come with the change of the hearts of His people. Go to him on your knees, humble yourself before him, confess every sin, even the ones you don't even know you did. Go stand before him with a repentant heart. Let's stand in the gap for those who are not repentant. Pray for your enemies. Pray. We must pray for our enemies. That's what Jesus told us to do. Those people that you perceive as your enemy, pray for them. Because God is able to change all things. 
God is able to heal this land. God is able to save this land. Anyways, in that voice, I'm going to pray. Ah, Father, we praise you. We honor you. We glorify you for who you are. You are the Alpha and Omega, Jesus, the beginning and the end. You were there from the beginning. You are the word that became flesh for us. You are the one who deserves all our praise, all the glory. Lord, you are the creator of the universe, the one who spoke and it was. It is an honor and a privilege to call ourselves your children, Lord. And that would only could only happen through the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that you died for us. Thank you that you are our Savior, that you chose us above your own, own wealth, your own comfort, your own godliness. You chose to become flesh for us. You humbled yourself, Lord, so that we could be saved, and we are forever thankful for that. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we come now and we put South Africa, we put our country before you, we put the people in our country before you, Lord, we humble ourselves before you, and we declare, Lord, that we are not worthy of anything. And we have sinned against you, Father, and we repent of that. Forgive us, Lord, forgive us for our iniquities. We lay this country before you, Lord. And we ask you, Lord, have mercy over us. Each one of your children, Father. Each single one of your children. Everyone called by the name of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that you will ignite a fire in them. A fire that will lead to humility and repentance. And a hunger, a deep hunger, Lord, to see your kingdom come. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you are always with us, that you never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you that you hear every cry, every outcry that is made in your name and according to your will. Thank you that we can trust you, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to love you and leave you now. This has been a very long episode. I hope you guys are blessed and take care. Bye.